Hello, everyone. My name is Yusuf, and I'll be presenting Spec Hammer, combining Spectre and Raw Hammer for new speculative attacks. This work was done in collaboration with Andrew Kong, Ingab Kang, Daniel Ginkin, and Kang Jishin. So, as we uh, just heard, the Spectre attacks revealed a new class of attacks, demonstrating the inherent insecurity of speculative execution, showing how branch prediction can be exploited in order to arbitrarily leak values from the victim's address space. For example, uh, let's assume the following behavior in victim code. A nested array access within a conditional statement where the attacker has control over the variable x. And we might think that all of our accesses must be in bounds because this conditional statement acts as a bounds check. Uh, but Spectre showed that we can send in values of x that will train the branch predictor to predict that the next value of x will be in bounds and that the branch should be taken. From here, we can uh, send in an out of bounds value of x causing us to enter a state of speculative execution, allowing us to touch this out-of-bounds secret data. Here, the secret will be used to index into another array. And we might be thinking that this is clearly a misprediction, so everything will be undone. Uh, but Spectre showed that there are microarchitectural side effects that will remain even after we resolve the branch. In particular, data will be pulled from this array into the cache. And now we have secret-dependent data sitting in the cache. And once we resolve the branch, uh, all the other accesses will be undone and nothing will be committed, but the data will remain there in the cache. From here, we can use a side channel where we access different lines in the cache, timing our accesses, and the timing differences will reveal which addresses were recently accessed. And since our most recent access was dependent on secret data, this can be used to retrieve the secret, showing how branch prediction allows us to arbitrarily read memory in the victim's address space. Now, while this is powerful, Spectre does have a key limitation and that it requires the attacker to control the variable x. For example, suppose there is a gadget in the Linux kernel that we want to exploit to arbitrarily read kernel values. We require a syscall that allows us to pass in values of x as an argument to the syscall so that we can manipulate this gadget to um, arbitrarily read these values and target the secrets we want to target. The reason why this is a limitation is that it allows for defenses that target this particular behavior, as taint tracking defenses can look for cases where X is coming from an untrusted source and prevent speculation from occurring on this code. For example, by adding offenses um, and serializing the code. Now, there are other cases of code in the kernel that we might be able to exploit as they contain this nested array access behavior within a conditional statement but the problem here is that all the variables are completely controlled by the kernel. They're considered completely trustworthy and we can't abuse them to arbitrarily target values in the kernel to leak them via Spectre. Uh, and so we have no way of directly exploiting them for arbitrary reads. What would be quite nice would be if we had a way to write to these kernel variables indirectly even though we aren't privileged users. And it turns out there's another vulnerability that will let us do exactly that called Rowhammer. This allows us to flip bits in memory that we don't have access to by rapidly accessing addresses that we do control. And this paper explores what happens when we combine these two attacks and how we can use this to create a more flexible Spectre attack. So before I go into that, I'll give a quick overview of Rawhammer. This vulnerability takes advantage of the nature of DRAM. Uh, in particular, a DRAM array consists of many cells that each use a capacitor to store a bit value. For example, a fully charged capacitor might store a one and a discharged capacitor might store a zero or vice versa. And any time we want to access DRAM, we're going to temporarily discharge uh, all the values in the capacitors in the corresponding row, and then that charge will be immediately restored. Rohammer will abuse this effect in order to flip it in the adjacent rows. In particular, if we alternate our accesses between two rows that pinch a particular victim row that we're targeting, we're going to rapidly discharge and recharge these capacitors to the point that we will accelerate the leakage rate in adjacent capacitors and pull their charge below their threshold value, flipping their value from one to zero or vice versa. And so we can rapidly um, access rows in memory to hammer victim rows and flip their bits. So now we would like to use this to execute a specter attack um, even without direct control over X. So we assume similar behavior to what we had before, this nested array access within the conditional statement. This time the attacker does not control X. And 
we assume that if we call this victim enough times, inbounds values of x will be used frequently enough that the branch predictor will naturally be trained to predict that the next value of x will be inbounds as well, and that the branch should be taken. So for example, suppose at some moment uh, x is equal to 2. And from here, we want to hammer x to flip a bit and point us to the secret value. Uh, and since the branch predictor has been trained, we'll enter a state of speculative execution, where a secret value is used to index into another array. This value gets pulled into the cache. And just like before, we have secret dependent data sitting in the cache that will remain there even after the branch is resolved, showing how we can run a specter like exploit even when we don't have control over x, thanks to row hammer. Uh, so we ran a proof of concept attack where we controlled uh, a thread that spawned a victim thread that contained this code of the nested array access within the conditional statement, and the attacker thread had no way of directly modifying the value of x. So we used this to leak a stack canary, since we just needed to flip a bit that pointed us just past the bounds of the stack that these arrays resided on, leading us to point to the canary. And we showed how we could leak this canary with 100% accurate leakage at a rate of 8 bits per second. Now, uh, you might have noticed a key limitation with this, which is that while we can point past the bounds of these arrays and target things like stack canaries, uh, we can only flip one bit at a time, and so it becomes difficult to arbitrarily target data in victim memory. Uh, in particular, suppose that we flip this bit to point to this value A, uh, and now we want to leak a new value in memory. So the first thing we have to do is find a new bit flip, which will take time. And additionally, we can only flip the next most significant bit or the next least significant bit, which is going to point us some distance away from A, uh, some power of 2 away. And the next value we want to leak has to be another even more significant bit, and we're going to be pushed even farther away. And these distances will continue to increase every new bit we flip. So there are gaps in what we can target, and we don't have the same flexibility that Spectre gave us of arbitrarily targeting any value in memory that we want to leak. So to get around this issue, we devised the triple gadget, which has similar behavior to what we saw before, except now we have a triple nested array access consisting of three arrays rather than two. And just like before, it's in a conditional statement where we have no direct control over x. And the goal here is to show how we can use just one row hammer bit flip in order to arbitrarily target any value in victim memory. So we begin like before, where we call this victim code enough times to naturally train the branch predictor to predict that x will be in bounds. Uh, and suppose again x is equal to 2. We'll now use raw hammer to flip a bit and point out of bounds. But instead of targeting the secret directly, we want to target data that we control. And we can set this value to be whatever we need, such that when it's used to index into the next array, it will point to the secret that we want to target. And now, just like before, the secret is used to index into another array. Uh, this data will get pulled into the cache. Secret dependent data remaining in the cache allows us to leak it via side channel. And so the advantage here is that we don't need to flip bits to point us directly to our secrets. We just need a flip that will point us from the region of memory we should be inside of uh, to this region of memory that contains data that we control. And from here, we can modify this value to point wherever in memory we want, allowing us to precisely target any value we want to leak. Now, even this has a limitation, which is that we do need a specific bit flip in order to get this to work. Uh, for example, using the simplified example where we're targeting the kernel, and we have a gadget that resides in the kernel, uh, and say that we want to cause a bit flip that will point us to data that we control in user space. Uh, so for example, we might need to flip bit 45 in order to uh, reach this data. The reason why this is a limitation is that row hammer tends to vary from dim to dim. And so different addresses will be vulnerable on different DIMMs, even if they're of the same model, make, and manufacturer. And so you just have to hammer many, many addresses on whatever DIMM your victim is uh, in order to find where the bit flips you need are and to find the flip at the particular address uh, and offset that you need. And so uh, at this point, we attempted to hammer the DIMMs that we had in order to try uh, finding the flips that we needed. Uh, but it took a prohibitively long amount of time to find these flips, uh, and so we thought that it wouldn't be practical to mount this attack. And so at this point, we noticed a key oversight in existing code, 
that was masking many of the flips that were actually happening in memory. In particular, uh, what the prior work would do, um, the prior procedures and the code attached to this prior work, it would begin by initializing memory uh, with all zeros or all ones, which would cause this data to get pulled into the cache. And from here, uh, we then hammer memory to induce bit flips in DRAM. And then we want to read memory to look for our flips. So in this case, we initialize with all zeros. So if we see any ones, we know we had a flip, and we know that that address is flippy. Uh, in this case, we only see zeros, so I guess we didn't have any flips, and we'll just move on. And there lies the problem in the prior work, which is that all of this initialized data written to memory sits in the cache, and when we come to read memory to check for our flips, we're just checking our cached initialization data. So uh, we end up missing flips. So we made a simple modification where we initialize memory, uh, again, by writing all zeros in this case, causing this data to get pulled into the cache. Now we flush these values, pushing them back into memory, ensuring that our next access will be a cache miss. We do our hammering to induce our bit flips. Uh, and now when we read memory to check for flips, we're going to have a cache miss, uh, ensuring that we can see any flips that happen in DRAM. And so we ran some tests on our DIMMs using prior work and using our own modified code over a two-hour period and counting the number of unique addresses that had bit flips. On the uh, prior work, we were able to find 38 flips over two hours. And when we added these cache flushes, we found over 11,000 flips within the same time window. And so this showed that the DIMMs that we were working with were way more vulnerable to row hammer than we initially thought, all thanks to this um, cache flushing issue. We ran this test on multiple DIMMs, DDR3 and DDR4, and we found similar results in all cases. Uh, you can see the full table in the paper. So at this point now, we have plenty of uh, flips to work with, and so we're ready to run a triple gadget proof of concept attack. In this case, we added a syscall to the Linux kernel that contained this triple gadget behavior, uh, and our goal was to dump kernel data. Uh, and so again, we call the syscall enough times to train the branch predictor as needed. And from here, we flip a bit. That's going to point us to data that we control. This attacker controlled data then points to the secret, as we described before, and then secret indexed to array. That will cause secret dependent data to be pulled into the cache. The cache side channel gives us our secret. Uh, and the goal here was to leak a string that sat as a global variable um, outside of the bounds of these arrays. We're able to leak values from this string with 100% uh, accuracy at a rate of 24 bits per second on DDR3 and six bits per minute on DDR4. So now the question remains of how does this affect the presence of gadgets in real world code? Uh, so we used an early gadget search tool that was an extension of Smash, which was a tool designed to find security bugs in the Linux kernel. And this tool uh, finds gadgets by looking for snippets of code where there are nested array accesses where an unprivileged user has control over the value x. We extended this tool to look for triple gadgets with the same condition of controlling x, as well as um, double gadgets where this variable was unmodifiable by unprivileged users, so in this case the variable a, and triple gadgets with the same unmodifiable condition. So the tool reported in the case of these user modifiable gadgets, 100 double gadgets and two triple gadgets, and when we remove this restriction that the attacker has to control the variable, this number increased to 20,000 double gadgets and 170 triple gadgets. Now this was an early tool, uh, and so it is prone to produce false positives, but at the same time, we don't take this number as a ceiling of the number of gadgets um, that are newly exploitable in the kernel, as uh, we were able to find false negatives as well. So we checked the Linux kernel code by hand um, and quickly found a case in page alloc.c which is responsible for handling physical page allocation in the kernel. And in this case, we have a triple nested pointer dereferenced where this struct pointer here gets dereferenced and the result of that dereference is used for another dereference and the result of that is used as an array uh, index variable. And so as far as Spectre is concerned, this triple nested pointer dereference is the exact same as a triple nested array access and we did indeed verify that uh, if we could flip this value here, we can uh, use the specter leakage to target arbitrary values in the Linux kernel. And so uh, this shows that we need the development of a tool that can more precisely find these gadgets that are exploitable, uh, and we leave the development of such a tool for future work. 
So in conclusion, we relax a key requirement of Spectre v1 that the attacker has to have control over the array offset variable. Uh, this led us to find new gadgets in the kernel, and we demonstrated proof of concept attacks with leakage rates of 24 bits per second and 6 bits per minute. Uh, we also found an oversight in existing uh, row hammer work that was masking many of the bit flips that were occurring in DRAM. Uh, and finally, while I didn't discuss it in this presentation, in the paper we show a new kernel stack massaging technique that we use to flip bits in the kernel stack. Uh, and while this was required for this attack, this could be useful for any future row hammer work that also wants to target uh, kernel stack variables. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, are there any questions? All right, any questions? Okay, we have a couple of few questions. Hi, Andrew Myers from Cornell. So this is uh, pretty fun. Um, the, you've reported that you found new kernel gadgets, but then you said you had false positives. Yes. Did you think about randomly sampling them so you could get a confidence interval on the number of kernel gadgets? Uh, no, we did not randomly sample them. Um, we did just make attempts at exploiting them. Uh, and most of the ones that we ran into, there were specific issues that prevented from running exploits on them. Uh, and we decided that we would just need a better tool in order to um, find gadgets that we could exploit. Um, and it seems that developing such a tool is still an open problem. Uh, and so we leave that for future work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your uh, amazing uh, talk. I had this question. How are you ensuring uh, that X is sandwiched between two aggressor rows? Also. Mm -hmm. How are you ensuring that X is in a vulnerable location of the DMO? Mm -hmm. Yes, so the one word answer is memory massaging, which was a big component of the attack and uh, of the paper. Uh, the quick answer, uh, I'll try to explain it quickly, is uh, that you start by hammering many addresses, and you're going to find an address that flips when you control two addresses. And so at that point, you know that you have this flippy page that you can reasonably produce uh, bit flips in. Um, and now you need to um, get the victim to use that flippy page and keep control over your aggressor pages so that when you hammer them, you can induce flips in that victim variable. And so um, you would like to force the victim to uh, allocate that page when you unmap it from memory. The problem is that the pool of free pages is, is full of free pages, and so there's a low chance that it's going to grab that one free page. So the basic idea is that you strip memory of all of the free pages and only free that one flippy page, so that next time when you force the victim to make his allocation, it will grab that flippy page. And then when you hammer um, the pages that you do control, you can induce flips in that variable. Uh, quick question there. Yes. Aren't you leaving a footprint kind of thing by allocating so many pages for the attacker? Yeah, so we, we did demonstrate um, our proof of concepts with nothing else running and um, assuming that uh, nothing was going to try to track the suspicious behavior of many pages being allocated. So that is a good point. Um, we don't account for that in this work, but uh, maybe future memory massaging procedures could explore something that's more uh, discreet. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the great talk. Uh, Anish from Georgia Tech. So uh, I noticed that the rate of, uh, the bandwidth of your attack was higher on DDR3 compared to DDR4, even mm -hmm. though from what we know, DDR4 is usually more vulnerable. So mm -hmm. do you have any insights on why that might be? Yeah, so on DDR4, we um, based our uh, technique on trespass, which uses a multi-sided row hammering approach. And on our DIMMs, we needed 10-sided hammering to induce bit flips. Um, and so there's a race condition when combining raw hammer inspector, which is that the wrench could be resolved before you have the chance to flip bits. And so sometimes we would run our attack and we wouldn't see anything on the side channel. Uh, and so we would have to run it repeatedly um, before we could observe the leakage. And so those repeated runs made it so that we could leak data at a slower rate. Yeah, that, that, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, the great talk. I was wondering, in the threat model where an attacker is able to induce bits to flip, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the reasoning to use Spectre as mm -hmm. a vector instead of a different 
mm -hmm. ways of attacking, right? Like the PT exploit or the super mm -hmm. binary except. Uh, so for example, if you want to target um, Linux kernel code like this and you induce this bit flip, uh, you end up with behavior in many cases that will just crash the kernel. For example, if this is trying to allocate physical pages and it points somewhere crazy, then the kernel will panic and crash. Um, so if you hide it inside of this misprediction, then you have the freedom to do whatever you want um, as long as you can fit it within that window and still exit gracefully. Uh, okay, I understand. So the concept is that Spectre gives us a more reliable, maybe, mm -hmm. or less detectable way of exploiting? Is that the case? Uh, less detectable, but also just more flexibility in that you can grab these values without causing a kernel crash if you are targeting the kernel, I for see. example. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, let's thank our speaker once again.